on the Tohono O'odham Tribal Reservation in Arizona. It's raining and cold today, but most of the time it's baking hot and bone dry. The plants here have evolved to thrive in such extremes, and the Tohono O'odham people in turn base their way of life on the plants. It was a rich bounty, and I do mean was, because by the 1940s widespread use of traditional foods was dying out. Today, only a few of the elders, like Francis Manuel, are familiar with the old foods. This is Francis's daughter, Dolores. This is wild spinach. We've been eating since I was, we were little. Tortillas were once made with desert ingredients. Now the elders are saying it's time to revive the old ways. Is this an attempt to go back totally to the food that used to be eaten or, or to just introduce some of it into the diet? It is an attempt in trying to create an awareness to people uh, uh, that they have to change. Something has to be done. This is what something has to be done about. Caroline Jackson, who lives on the nearby Pima Reservation, has diabetes. So do half of all adult Pima and Tohono O'odham. 15 times the national average. The two tribes also have exceptionally high rates of obesity, even though their diets are average. Extensive study has suggested that in one special way, these people are not average. They have what's called the thrifty gene, which allowed them to put on weight very efficiently during the desert's times of plenty, so they could get through the bad times. The problem is it's good times all the time now. Nowadays, like all Americans, they get their food from a supermarket shelf. They spend a lot of time in front of the TV. But, but, but some of these rides are pretty darn exciting. And they drive practically everywhere. Only 50 years ago, the two tribes were tough and active farmers, hunters, and gatherers with no obesity and no diabetes. Things began to break down when the region's water was pumped away to growing cities. And even though they still had the skills to gather wild food or divert flash floods to their fields, it became impossible to resist adopting a typical American lifestyle. So you make a, a brush out of this and you rub the, um, the fruit with it and that gets the needles off? You see the fruits will be sitting up here, you know, like that, and you'll brush them off. Brush them off pretty good. A brush made from the creosote bush gets off the almost invisible coating of tiny, sharp spines. Prickly pear fruit and pads were important foods, although you had to avoid the poisonous seeds, Danny said. Oh, that's, that's a mesquite tree right here. Mm -hmm. See, here's some of the dried bean. And they'll be hanging, hanging on the trees and the kids will walk by and pull them off and mm. eat them. Mesquite pods could be ground up to make a sweet and nutritious flour. They were good to just chew on as well. Taste oh, it? Oh, I can, yeah. yeah, can I? Can I I'll just yeah. take off yeah. a little bit. I don't want to yeah. spoil it but for somebody. don't swallow the seeds too. Don't swallow the seeds. <laughs> <laughs> What will happen to me if I swallow Same it? Same thing it happens to when you eat the prickly pear with the seeds. Which I had to go to the hospital. Uh -huh, yeah, and gave me an enema. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, this program is really dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all seeds. What do you mean don't swallow the seeds? There's nothing but seeds here. Chew it. I'm talking. Mm -mm, I'm going to get rid of the seed, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Throw it out. Throw it that way. It's now sweet, uh -huh. sweet, you're and you're and chewy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it tastes like something that I know. It tastes like you know what it tastes like? Like a box of Cracker Jacks. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's sweet and and crunchy. Uh -huh. It's a snack bush. Mm -hmm. yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. Francis, how did you learn about all this? My grandmother told me. Your grandmother. When we were kids. Uh huh. Yeah. On this plant, the choya buds grow. In spring, when the rains came, everyone had to gather choya cactus buds. Okay, so that's where they grow. And then, and then if you don't pick it, it grows into this. Huh? Yes, uh huh? Like mesquite pods, choya buds were gathered, dried, and stored in large quantities. What is it that you eat off of this? Um, the uh, saguaro fruit. It grows on the end of 
of the arms of the cactus. Yeah. Usually it'll grow in bunches, you know, on each arm, all the way up into the top. Saguaro fruit was gathered in late June. Every family had its own long poles for reaching the fruit. Poles made with the skeleton of the saguaro cactus itself. The desert for most of us looks to be a barren and inhospitable place. But for the Pima and Tohono Odom, it was the source of life. Our food came from the desert. Um, mm -hmm. We had to work for it. You know, it was a lot of work to go out and gather. Uh, when we planted, there was a lot of time in the field. Back then, uh, we were people who were in uh, good shape. Prior to 1960, there was no diabetes. And then, but after that, it just kind of came upon us. The blessing speaks of the pleasure given by plants growing and covering the earth. It's appropriate because we're going to have a meal made entirely of crops which grow in the desert around us. That's good. We're joined by Gary Nabhan, a botanist who specializes in the desert plants of the southwest. These are, uh, these are beans? These are red tepary. Yeah. Tepary beans were grown in the flood plains. They resist desert heat and they're digested slowly. Good for diabetics who need to avoid spikes in blood sugar. It turns out all the foods have some special quality. It's like a spinach. It's a wild spinach. Wild spinach. Wild spinach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it comes up in the summer, and it's really the best tasting spinach in the world. These are sliced prickly pear pads. We'll talk more about them in a minute. And here's the wild spinach. Amaranth greens with high protein seeds and high calcium leaves. What is this? It's mesquite. Beans. Oh, mesquite. Okay, so, so just like one teaspoonful? Oh, two. 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 Okay. One, two, and then That's I... enough. <laughs> <laughs> the mesquite drink is full of sugar, but it's a kind of sugar that you don't need insulin to digest. You know, if you don't like it... That's good. What do you mean if I don't like it? That's good. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Next, Choya cactus buds. Frances gathered and dried these herself last spring six months ago. And finally, my personal favorite, really powerful little wild chilies gathered up in the mountains on the reservation. This is the first thing At last it was time to dig in. This is a fantastic meal. <laughs> what are the ways in which this food reconnects you to the culture? Well, uh, I just thought of how they used to tell kids, you know, I guess the way, you know, when you try to get kids to eat, uh, Things like the uh, spinach or the uh, toya bud. Yes. Uh, they used to say, like, if we don't eat it, uh, eat it. That's the creator that they believed in years ago will cause a flood, you know. Mm. So you better eat your spinach or your toya bud. Or, you, or you'll, there'll be a flood. Or you will all drown, like maybe right now. <laughs> because these foods are adapted to the desert, they all share one attribute the ability to retain scarce water. How they do it was demonstrated by Gary Nabhan with a bowl of chia seeds from a type of desert mint. Over the course of a few minutes, the dry seeds swell up, absorbing about 15 times their volume of water. It's how they'd react to a sudden rainstorm in the desert. Desert plants have to be able to absorb water and then hold on to it for as long as possible. They do it with a kind of natural glue. It's all called soluble fiber, but uh, prickly pear cacti and their relatives, the Choya cactus, are among the richest sources of that. And so when we look at a prickly pear pad like this, and I'm going to get the uh, spines in my uh, fingers, but I don't mind that because I'm a botanist. When you look at this stuff, yes. all this stuff is extracellular mucilage. There's a goo in between the cells here mm -hmm. that holds water in the pad 
so that even during times of drought, that water is only slowly lost from the plant. That's why a prickly pear can survive years without rain. In the cactus, that goo gets in between the cells. What does it do when it goes into my body? It doesn't go in between my cells, does it? Well, that's the great thing. When we put it in our stomachs, it keeps any sugars or carbohydrates from being rapidly released into our bloodstream. So that instead of our blood sugar levels spiking, peaking very rapidly, and then our pancreas trying to make insulin to so keep up So you don't get a that. jolt of it. You, you, no you get jolt. It on a, more on a, on a, it's, it's doled out more evenly. Go ahead. This slow release is the secret to the desert foods because it provides natural protection against diabetes. So as the desert people were yo-yoing up and down in weight, tracking the feast or famine of their crops, their metabolisms were always maintained on an even keel by these perfect foods. I was learning some interesting stuff on this visit. And I got really excited when it looked like Francis was ready to reveal to me an ancient, precious piece of tribal wisdom. Uh -huh. Why are the Indians here first? The question is, why did the Indians live here first? Well, they lived here first. Yes. Because. Because. Because uh, th th they didn't live anyplace else yet. <laughs> You're coming away. No, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> They, I think I'm stuck. I think I'll, I, I'd actually most like to hear your answer. <laughs> oh, my answer is easy. Because they have a reservation. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. 